Hey everybody, I'm Mage Hybrid. You already read the title, so let's not waste any time. We're going to select single player. We're going to select new game. Now, you'll see that uh, we have a few start ages we can start from. We're just going to pick High Middle Ages, which is the earliest. It will recommend a few people that we could be, but for the sake of showing you how to do this, we're going to go custom game setup. Right off the bat, it's going to look like a bit of a mess. Uh, not clearly seeing where borders are. So we just want to go up to where it says realms here and this shield, click that and everything looks much nicer. Uh, for the sake of teaching you in this video, we're just going to pick France, uh, but I'll show you at the end of the video who I recommend you play as if it's your first time playing. So we're King Philippe. These are the game rules. You can pick everything you want, like Iron Man mode and all kinds of things is probably a bit overwhelming. The only thing that I really recommend that maybe you change from all these defaults is near the end, there's cultural title names. By default, this is on. I like to turn it off. If you have it off, all that means is that no matter what culture has taken over an area, the name of that area will always be in whatever language you have your game set to. You can save rules and load rules later if you like little templates. Let's start. So we started the game. Uh, the first thing you're going to need to know is the map modes down by your mini map here. Game's paused, by the way, by default. Uh, realms is normally what you want it on. For whatever reason, the default is terrain. It's ugly and hard to see anything. For the most part, you're pretty much always going to have realms. Realms is essentially countries mode, which is probably what you're more familiar with. We have all kinds of things that like diplomatic relations. We have religion where we can see this is the Catholic world, the Sunni world, the Shia world, Maya Fizites are down there. So spend a little bit of time when you have some time, go through these. So the first thing we need to talk about before we even get into any gameplay is the idea of this game. Unlike most strategy games, we're not playing as a country, we're playing as a family dynasty. If we were to click on our character here, we can see that we are part of House Capet, I believe is how you pronounce that. So we can see we have a whole family tree here. If we were to be dethroned from France, we wouldn't keep playing as France, we'd keep playing as our family and wherever they wound up. With the day that we have no land anymore being the day that the game is over, or when we run into the final time limit. We're not always going to be King Philippe. One day he'll die, his heir will take over, whoever that ends up being at the time. Another very quick thing to explain that a lot of people have troubles with in this game is the rank system. They're not familiar with feudal ranking. So if we zoom in here, we can see that these are individual counties. So we're gonna go for the bottom and then take you all the way to the top of the ranks. So if we zoom in here to Paris, then you can see we have all kinds of castles and cathedrals and cities and whatnot. These are baronies, the lowest uh, rank in holding land. You'll have mayors and bishops and barons in the castles. So if we zoom in on one here by clicking on the crest, we can click on a random guy. He's a mayor, so he is of the baron rank. He answers to a count. A count runs a county, which is an entire part of land here, so at the top here is always going to be whatever barony rules the county. So we are the Count of Paris, which means that all of these barons pay their tax to us. A baron runs a barony, which is a grouping of counties. So if we look at the County of Paris, I want de Jurtais, I want the Duchy of Valos. So all of the counts within that would pay tax to the duchy, or the duke. And the duke would also run a county and through that a barony. Over top of that is a king. We're a king. A king rules over a kingdom. They rule ahead of dukes. The dukes pay them the taxes. They get the taxes from the counts who gets it from the, the uh, barons. And of course, a king will also have some of his own land. So he is also a baron and a count and probably a duke. The only thing above that is an emperor who rules over kings, and I'm sure you can already understand how that whole line of succession goes. The way you can tell them apart, because they might have different titles depending on the religion that they're ruled by, we're just going to show you right here. That 
kind of crown there with the vertical pearls. That's a barony. Uh, the crown with the spikes with the pearls on top is a count. A duchy crown has some actual gemstones in the front. It's got the red and the blue, still with pearls along the top. A king's crown is probably the one you're most familiar with, where it has the kind of golden dome coming in over top of the red velvet. And lastly, an emperor's crown is the big purple crazy looking one with all of the little gemstones. Now, no matter what culture you go into and what they call it, like over here, this is the Caliph, uh, he's running a kingdom, which would be a sultanate normally uh, in the Muslim world. A sheikdom would be a county, and an emir would be a duchy, so on and so forth. You can tell all of it by the crowns. Your character sheet. We're King Philippe of France. Now, we don't have all of our traits yet because we are underage. We're only 14, as you can see by hovering over our face here. And you're an adult at 16. We're right here. And this is our main uh, holding, which is the Kingdom of France. This is the succession line and all of that. We are Catholic, which is a Christian denomination, as we can see right here. It says our religious uh, head and everything. We'll look more into that later. Our government type is right here. We're feudal, of course. Our culture is here. We're French, which is a Latin culture. Now, the most important things for you right here are five stats. Diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, and learning. Diplomacy is how much other people like us and our ability to do diplomatic things in events. The number on the left is our skill at it, which is zero, that's as low as it goes. The number on the right is our state skill. So this is our skill plus our counselor skill who specializes in that, we'll get into that later, plus half of our wife's skill. We don't have a wife for underage right now. Martial skill, how good we are in combat at leading the troops directly, as well as how many troops we can have in the country. Uh, right now we have about four and a half thousand in levies, we'll get into that. Stewardship is how much money we make and how big our domain can be, so how much land we can personally own. Intrigue is how good we are at sinister evil plots and also how good we are at avoiding them. And learning is a little bit vague, it's used in a lot of events, and it's generally how fast technology can develop and spread within your country, but it's considered uh, usually a bit of a weak stat. Down here is the real flavor of the game, these are your traits. We are lustful, so we are down in piety, which I will get into, up in intrigue, up in fertility, but the Christian church opinion is down. Diligent, we're better at everything and vassals like us more, but slothful people won't like us as much. Deceitful, our intrigue is up and our diplomacy is down, we are just our stewardship, learning, and vassal opinion are all up. So you can see, these traits are what make our stats for the most part. Uh, education plays a bit of a role in it, but these stats are how you really get a read on people, how you get the flavor of the game, and will determine how a lot of random events in the game are going to go. Up along here, we have our domain size, that is how many individual uh, baronies we can hold, and counties, things like that, no, we can hold. So we have two, we can hold three. If you go over this limit, you start taking big money penalties, and if you go really far over this limit, then your vassals might get really upset that you're hogging all of the land. Your vassal limit, this is how many vassals that you can reasonably directly have answering to you. That's why you break things down into uh, baronies and whatnot, so that the barons can handle all the little accounts and you'll just handle the barons. Stuff like that. You want to minimize this number as much as possible. If it goes wildly over the number, you'll start to have problems where, uh, upon death, maybe some of the vassals break away out from under your control. Things like that. I believe you can also run into issues where they're not giving you their full levy. Um, because vassals pay you tax. That's not just money in these days, that's also part of their levy, which is part of the troops they can raise. So their, packs, their tax is paid to you in both money and how many troops they can raise. And the ratio of how much is money and how much is troops, that's up to whatever the leader of the country is to set that law. These are our army levies, so this is how big of an army we can muster up right now. Our wealth, this is how much gold we own that we can then spend on things. Our prestige, which is a very, very rough stat that roughly means if you have tons and tons of it, people respect you more 
and thus they like you more, you can spend it on some things. It's one of those things you don't need to pay super close attention to, but try not to let it get too negative, especially if you're of a high rank. And piety is how much religious prestige you have. If you're Catholic, you can cash this in with the Pope to get some money and stuff, but for the most part, you don't need to worry about it too much if you're just starting the game. Over here we have our titles. This is everything we directly own, kingdoms, some counties. Claims, this is if we have a claim to any land that we don't currently own, and diplomacy, if there's any kind of special uh, diplomatic agreement going on here, like a truce or something, it would let you know. Family, gives you all your breakdown of all your family, you can click them from here and go to their pages. Relations, if we had friends or rivals or anything like that, we could see them here. Vassals, this is everybody who answers to us and their opinion of us. Also lets us know if they have any tax problems, for instance, they're not paying us, like some of these people. If we go to court, we can see that this is everybody who lives within our court who isn't necessarily a vassal, so they don't own land, or don't necessarily own land. Pacts, if we had any alliances or non-aggression pacts, anything like that, they'd be here. And abroad, if any of our courtiers or people in our court are currently in a foreign nation for whatever reason, whether they be imprisoned or whatnot, uh, that will show up here so we can still easily find them. Next, I'm going to very quickly run you through these top menus. So first, and you might not know this is a menu, you can click on your title here. This will show you all of your land and everything within it. Uh, the de jure thing goes from showing you everything in your land to letting you break down into individual things like the Empire of Francia, which would be if we have all of that land and we could create that title and that would make us an empire, but we don't have that land. We can see our line of succession here, we can see where all of our money comes from and where it might be getting skimmed off the top. Uh, we can see our yearly income, all of that stuff. You've already seen this menu, so we're gonna go to our council now. These are the Chancellor, Marshal, Steward, Spymaster, and Court Chaplain. As you can see, they correlate to your different stats. So the Chancellor gives you his 15 Diplomacy, the Marshal his 14 uh, Marshal skill, all of that stuff, and you can appoint different people, and this is all about being a social game, of course. So, uh, they might like you or dislike you, and that might affect how they do their job. Each one has three abilities if you don't have the expansions. So we have improved diplomatic relations, for instance, where we can put him somewhere and he'll try and make the locals like us, like the local lords. Fabricate claim is very important. This is the easiest way to get a claim to declare war and take land. And so descent. Maybe try and make it so that the vassals in that area don't like their liege. So you can use this to stir things up or to befriend people. You could uh, suppress a revolt here if you think a place is going to revolt, or train troops to get your levy size up to garner a larger army. The steward is going to be collecting taxes, because it's by far the best thing the steward can do, almost always, is put it in your wealthiest place and have him increase the money you get from there. Your spymaster could be studying technology in Constantinople to bring new technology into your country, could be building a spy network or could be scheming for you, for your offense or defense in S espionage, and your court chaplain could of course be trying to convert heathens, research cultural technology, or improve religious relations. Minor titles here, many of these are just things you appoint to people to make them like you a little bit more, give them a little more prestige and a little bit more salary, which you don't need to pay personally. However, there's a few important things. You can have, and it looks like they're already assigned, or at least we can't assign them because we're a child, but normally up here would be your regent, which is, if for whatever reason you're incapacitated, who will rule in your stead. You want that to be someone you trust. And in some government types, you can also appoint who your successor will be. Also, at the bottom, we have our commanders. These are the people who will lead your troops into battle, which will, uh, showing actual battle will be another video. Laws tab is where you can set all of your laws. First, you set your inheritance laws. What kind of inheritance do you have? Who can inherit? Your realm laws, which are things like crown authority, which will change the autonomy of all of your vassals. You have where your money can go with your religious institutions, whether it always goes to the Pope or whether your people have the choice whether it goes to the Pope, and how centralized your government are, which is the more centralized, the less vassals you can control, but the more land you can control directly, as well as obligations. These are things like the tax laws, largely, tax and levy laws for your vassals. Technology. 
This will unlock different kinds of buildings in the game as well as different stats for said buildings. This goes up naturally with time as long as you're a high enough rank. And uh, studying technology with your spy is also a great way of getting this. This will very naturally go up over time. It's something you largely are hands off in, but later in the game you can get some buildings and whatnot that can help you with technology spread a bit. The military tab is an important one. So this is your military tab, your army levies and your fleet levies. Fleet are for transporting troops over water. Army is your army. So up here is our personal army from our domain. We can just click to raise it and you can see these are our armies right there. They have a monthly cost of four, which is putting us in debt actually, because we're, we only have 3.66. Uh, but these are our personal armies. We pay for them. We can march them around, do whatever we want with them. They can die and they can retrain and whatnot. We can also raise our vassal armies. When we're this big of a country, we're going to have much more of them. Now, over time, your vassals get annoyed because they're the ones who have to pay for this. We're not paying for this. But if it's a defensive war, if someone declared war on us, then they're fine with you raising their levies. Lastly is hired if we want to hire any mercenaries here to help us out. Or later in the game when the crusades are going and everything, you can hire some holy orders to help you out. And this is a vassal breakdown of how many troops are coming from what people, and if you want to raise it only from certain people. The intrigue menu. This is a fun one. Uh, this is where, if we wanted to, we could choose plots to kill people and, and revoke titles and whatnot. Now, we can't right now because we're a child, but normally this would be we click on it and there's a list of people we could kill. Or we could click on any random person in the world and it'll say right here, valid plot, murder. And once you select it, it'll show up right here. And you can find your backers for the plot. You'll, it'll show you your plot power, how high your chance is and how likely you are to quickly carry out the plot. If you'd like, I can make a whole video on that, although it would be a pretty short one. It is very self-explanatory. Your known plots here is how many plots you've found out that exist. I recommend you don't auto-stop plots because you can actually kind of bribe people and, you know, blackmail people, use against them that you know there's a plot, imprison them even. This is your list of prisoners. You could ransom them or kill them or release them or torture them or whatever you want. And a list of what your spy master believes to be threats, which is mostly people plotting against you, but also when factions rise up against you, which we'll get into soon. There are also decisions in here, not necessarily associated with intrigue, and yet they're in this menu. Things like promoting commander, where you just spend a little money and you just get a commander. Getting a random holy man, a noble, a, a woman to marry can hold a feast, a summer feast, or a grand tournament. And as you get more expansions and you play the game more, more of these decisions will be available. But in general, they're little things we can spend little bits of money to help you out in little ways for the most part. Factions. This is if your vassals are unhappy, they might start a faction. Maybe they don't want your son to inherit because they think that your son's awful. Maybe they think that your brother should inherit. Well, maybe a faction will start up of powerful vassals who say, hey, we want to overthrow the king and make it so your brother is the king now. And it will show you here the percentage of their army compared to your army if there were a civil war. And you can deal with that however you want, by befriending them, or assassinating them, or however you see fit. Religion, this shows us our religion, this shows us our religious figures within our country, and in this case, because we're Catholic, whether they prefer the Pope or us. If I unpause the game, it'll probably switch. Let's just... There we go. Unpaused for a second, it switched, so they'll pay us now, which is awesome! Uh, <laughs> our balance changed again, though. But this shows us our religious head, so we can see the current Pope and everything, and we can interact with them if we want to. And lastly, societies. I don't know why this is on here, because without the expansions, I don't believe you can join any of the societies. Uh, it's it's entirely possible that there might be one you can join without the, ex without the Monks and Mystics expansion, uh, but I don't know of it. Next is the notifications. They all pop up along here. Uh, pretty much all of them you'll understand just by hovering over them. We can create some titles, you know, some duchies and stuff, we just don't have the cash. Simple enough. Uh, righteous imprisonment. We can righteously imprison this jerk. He's done something to get him imprisoned. Uh, oddly enough, the game doesn't really have a good way of telling you why you can do that most of the time. Oh, with him it's because he's excommunicated. Here we go. It does actually tell us with this one. No one will care if we imprison him. 
because he's excommunicated from the church. I mean, you could imprison anybody in your country, or at least attempt to. However, it's probably going to be seen as tyrannical if you can't justify it. And idle council members, because we haven't told them to do anything. Next, I'm going to really quickly explain provinces. So we're going to click uh, Paris, because we are the owner of this. So right here is the capital duchy here. There's a list of the other duchies in it down here, which are owned by different people. You can see on the right the crest of the kingdom they're in, and on the left the crest of the individual person holding the place. We can see the technology levels here through culture, economics, and military. We can see the total tax right here. We could raise its levy right here. We can see it's a religion is Catholic, its culture is French. Its supply is right there, which means that that's how many troops could stand there without starving. It's got no revolt risk. And that's all the info on that. You could click any individual place in here and you could pay to start upgrading things within it, like upgrade the city walls, increase its tax a little, levy size a little. But keep in mind that if you're not directly owning it, then the guy who does own it is probably going to pay to upgrade those. Maybe save your money for the places you own, which has the green border. Like, I own this castle, so I... It would be a good idea that I upgrade these castles because I get the most benefit out of it. I'm not getting a benefit after tax, I'm getting the direct benefit. And you can see as I click on it, it gives me a little info, like all the troops I get from here, the money I get from here per year, stuff like that. And that all goes up as I upgrade these things. You can just hover over and learn all about them. So now I want to explain to you getting married, because obviously getting married is a big part of this game, because you're playing as a family dynasty. You need to have kids. So all you do is when you're not married, you click on your character, and there'll be a little arranged betrothal here, or arranged marriage if you're already an adult. You click on it, and it will bring you a list of who it thinks are the best bachelors for you. Now you could also hit period, on your keyboard and search this, uh, search all, diplomatic range, yes, gender, or woman, and sort by all kinds of things. Find the, the woman, I, I want to uh, join court, yes. I want the, the woman in the world with the best stewardship skill is you, and I could have her invite to court or arrange betrothal. You could do all kinds of little things, uh, assuming the leader of that country agrees. But these are people who will al already agree to it. Matrilineal marriage is if you want the wife to, uh, the, the kids to be of the wife's family, which we don't want that. Uh, so I'm just going to sort by who's best with money, which is generally a good idea. You can either go for certain traits that are really good, like attractive and strong, because you want your kids to have that. You could go for a wife who's really good with money, because you'll get half her stewardship, and that'll be good for having a lot of land and making a lot of money and developing your lands. Or you could go for diplomatic ties. Um, if we see here, you'll notice that this will get us a non-aggression pact with the different people who are associated, so usually the father. Um, we could use this for diplomatic reasons. I mean, if we wanted a non-aggression pact with uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, we could arrange a betrothal with us and... Um, what is this? One of his daughters? 20 years old? Uh, I mean, she's not bad. Sure. He doesn't agree. <laughs> he doesn't want to marry off uh, the princess and heir to a duchy. I can understand why. But uh, maybe a smaller place would agree to that. But all we're going to do is we're just going to pick for the sake of uh, for the sake of this. We're going to pick someone with money. We right click them and we see that they will agree to this. It's bad for our own prestige because we're only marrying a count, but we don't really care. So we're just going to say yes. And as we unpause the game and run the clock a little bit, you know, we'll we'll get the marriage and everything. The betrothal will start, and when we're 16, the actual marriage will happen. So this game is uh, kind of real time. You can see it's paused right now, but we can hit the space part to unpause it. That was very quick. Uh, yes, we are betrothed now. And we can see that there are these arrows. As we hit the plus and minus here, or I'm hitting them on my keyboard, we speed up and slow down the game. You're going to notice that for a lot of time in this game, it might feel like maybe you're messing up because you've got the clock going super, super fast. That's completely normal. A big part of this game is running the clock and in between when you have plans to do things, you're running the clock and you're letting things happen. A big part of this game is the random events like inheritance and whatnot. Sometimes there are pop-ups of crazy things happening, especially as you have more expansions. 
that's more likely to happen. It's completely normal to let years go by, building money, buying things, and it will happen very, very quickly. Just know that if that's happening a lot, don't feel like you're playing the game wrong, because you totally are. The goal of this game is to do whatever you want. There is no actual proper win condition. You have a score up here that every time you die, it tallies up the score of that family dynasty member, and by the end, you've got whatever score you've got. You will see, by the way, we have a dangerous faction starting up who wants Duke Robert to uh, be the uh, leader of France. As you can tell, uh, Duke Robert is the only guy <laughs> in it, and his troops almost rival mine. He's got 72% of what I have, which is a little bit scary. If you're going to play the game, uh, what I recommend, everybody calls it Noob Island, and I agree it is great to learn on, is Ireland. Pick the start of uh, 1066 and pick Munster. You can pick this King Mershad of Munster. Pick this guy. You can expand out, slowly learn how to conquer, slowly fabricate claims, hire claimants, learn the game slowly, check the wikia a lot, it's very useful, and your goal can be to unite Ireland. And then from there you can, you can move out and try and make the Empire of Britannia if you want to by taking over all of Great Britain. So that's a good goal for you if you want to learn the game. And of course, wars are something I'd like to teach you in another video as it's its own bag of worms. In fact, I wouldn't mind in that video explaining every Cassius Belli in the game, because unlike a lot of strategy games, you can't just declare war on somebody because you want to. Not necessarily if you want to take their land. You need to have a claim to their land, unless it's like a holy war or something. And uh, we'll have to get into that in, t in another video, because it is just too long to explain in this video. If you want to watch me play some of this game to see a little bit in action, I have a playthrough as Asturias, which is a northern Spanish country, which was very fun. I believe it was 52 episodes, all in a playlist, which will be on screen as well as in the description. A lot of holy wars in that one. I also have a playthrough I'm doing right now on Twitch TV that I upload on YouTube every single week where I play as the Sheik of Mecca, and we've already expanded out and made our whole kingdom for ourselves. Both of these will be on screen as well as in the description. If you have any more Crusader Kings 2 tutorial videos that you'd like to see, let me know. Tune in again next week, I'll be doing one of these for Hearts of Iron 4. Thank you everybody so much for watching, and until next time, have a nice day.